<clears throat> hey, we're live. Welcome to Facebook Live. I'm Highland Slobodkin, broadcasting from Seattle, Washington. And I'm Stuart Winograd here in the great state of Georgia. No mountains like Highland got up there, but you know, if we go about an hour north, we can. I got a few Shabbat candles here and some nice uh, decor that my wife Chantal designs. She makes everything beautiful for us. I'm so appreciative of a good wife, and I know you are too, Highland. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, a, a, a good wife who can find, right? Man, it's a blessing. I'm blessed. 41 years, and yeah, you're 50. 52 for me. 52. Yeah, Man, you don't look a day over 52 yourself. Yeah, thanks a lot. You see all this uh, gray hair in here, right? Yeah. I, I earned it. Yeah. So today we're going to talk about a uh, subject which has a lot of people confused. We want to talk about, uh, hey, have you ever wondered why God chose the Jewish people and for what? I mean, I grew up understanding that we, the Jewish people, were chosen. But whenever I would ask my uncles or my father, why were we chosen? They, <laughs> we don't know, you know. And so... Uh, you know, I in reading the scriptures, I discovered it's not because we were the largest group of people. It wasn't because we were the strongest. It wasn't because we were the wealthiest, even though we're pretty good business people, as evidenced in uh, when God was coming around with the Ten Commandments. We asked him, how much does it cost? He said nothing. And we said, we'll take 10, you know, so good business. But uh, that's not true. Don't uh, that was just a my joke. family he used to say, you know, God, why did you choose us? Couldn't you choose somebody else? You know, I mean, that sounds like Tuvia from uh, Fiddler on the Roof. Fiddler, Lord, look at the persecution we've had to endure through the ages, you know, choose somebody else for a change. But as you were saying, you know, God had a purpose in choosing the Jewish people. Absolutely. I think, Highland, you know, some people say we're kind of like twins. Maybe it was because we, the Jewish people, and especially you and I, were so good looking. I don't know. No, uh, so it ain't that right. either. But, uh, um, you know, when you might be confused about this, as many of my family members have been throughout the years. So we trust that today as we dig into the Holy Scriptures, the Bible, both the Tanakh, the Old Testament, and the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, that this will become clear. Why did God choose the Jewish people and for what? And you're going to be ahead of a lot of folks once you get these scriptures down. So uh, let's, let's start digging in. Highland, what do you got for us uh, to start off? Well, to begin with, I want to say that... Um... God, when he chose Avram, Abram, uh, he chose him because he saw him, he found him in Ur of the Chaldees, which is current day Macedonia, uh, kind of, uh, not Macedonia, I'm sorry, uh, Mesopotamia, south of uh, B Babylon, Iraq area. Um, he, cho he, he chose him because he found a man of faith, a man who believed in him. Hmm. So God makes a covenant in Genesis begins in, in Genesis 12, the cover, they, they cut the covenant in Genesis 15. God makes a covenant with, with Avram that he's going to bless him. And the covenant involved two things. It involved land and people. God was going to make a covenant with Avram for a, a specific piece of real estate, which is described in scripture from the Nile in Egypt. We don't know exactly, from, so for the river in Egypt, we don't know if it's the Nile. There's another river in the Sinai peninsula area from the Nile, uh, the river in Egypt, sorry, the river in Egypt, to, yeah. to the Euphrates. And from south, we don't know exactly where the border is. Uh, I think it's kind of uh, part of Saudi Arabia today and the, the uh, uh, Sinai Peninsula, all the way up about the middle of Lebanon. So all of that was land that God had promised to Avram. And the second part of the, the covenant was people that uh, he would give them descendants that would be like the stars of the sky and like the sand of the seashore. And through Avram and his descendants, all the families of the earth would be blessed. That's the beginning. 
Yeah, and he changed his name to Abraham, the father of many nations. And uh, I know you mentioned that scripture in uh, Exodus, but I'm going to jump ahead a little bit to Deuteronomy and uh, read uh, chapter 7 here, because it helps us to understand why God chose the Jewish people, and uh, it builds upon what Rabbi Hyland was talking about in this covenant he made with Abraham. And I'm going to take a look at chapter 7 of Deuteronomy, and I'm going to start with verse 6 and go forward from there. So uh, it says this, For you are a people that are to be holy to the Lord your God. Holy means separated, following after him in his ways. The Lord your God has chosen you. Oh, okay, we're going to get something here. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. Wow, that's a huge honor and responsibility. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you. See, God's motivation is love. God is love. And uh, when he chose the Jewish people, he had the Gentiles in mind as well. So we're going to talk about that a little later. But his motivation is love because God is love. And uh, the scriptures teach us that. But it was because the Lord, we're in verse 8 now, because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your forefathers that he might bring you out with a mighty hand and he redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is faithful God, keeping his covenant. There you go. I alluded to that covenant, his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commands. Amen. Of those who hate him, he will repay to their face by destruction. He will not be slow to repay their face to their face, those who hate him. So it's not a good idea so, to hate God. And the way we hate God is to either reject his existence or reject his teachings and commands. And so uh, I want to encourage everybody as we look at why God has chosen the Jewish people, don't reject God's existence, don't reject the fact that he loves you, and don't reject his commands and teachings and think you know better, because ultimately, it is a painful existence, ultimately, whether you're rich or poor in between, it is a sorrowful existence, and you can have a full and abundant existence on this earth, by connecting with the creator, the God of Israel, the God of heaven and earth, and he sent us a Messiah to empower us to live a life in fellowship with him and more and give us eternal life. So that's just a little side note. Uh, so we, we're talking about, ever wonder why God chose the Jewish people? We're digging into the scripture and we're going to find out why. And we just saw one uh, important verse here, and we're going to find out for what. So where else do we want to go in the Bible from here, Highland? I just want to reiterate that um, God's relationship with the Jewish people began with a covenant, and we break covenants because we're sinful humans, but God never breaks a covenant. God is perfect, and God has never broken his covenant with the Jewish people. He's disciplined our people for rebellion and disobedience, but he's always brought them back. Always said, I'm, I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. God has been there. So just like a father disciplines his children. So our father in heaven disciplines his children also, but the relationship began with a covenant that God has kept. That's why the people of Israel, the Jewish people are called the chosen people because God chose them to be, it says in Isaiah, a couple of places, Isaiah 43 and a couple other places, 
that Israel would be a light to the nations, that God wanted the Jewish people to be his priests, he actually called them a kingdom of priests, that they would be the intercessors between man and God, and the nation Israel were supposed to be uh, uh, the, the messengers of God's truth to the nations. Uh, we haven't always done a good job. Um, I don't know how you would rate that, but um, many Jewish people have kept the covenant. We are part of the covenant, and it's our job as shepherds, uh, Rabbi Stewart and myself, to speak the word of God with boldness and with love, speak the truth in love so that the nations, the world, the nations, the goyim, the Gentiles, can get this same truth and learn about the covenant and the loving relationship that God has for all people, like, like, like you said, Stuart, Jews and Gentiles alike. Yeah, super important point that uh, when God chose the Jewish people, it wasn't because we were better or worse than anyone else. That's right. It was uh, because of his covenant, because of his, his love, because of Abraham's faithfulness. And at the same time of loving the Jewish people, he had not only the Jewish people in mind, he had the people of every nation in mind. And it was with love he had both Jewish people and the people of the nations in mind. And so you alluded to Isaiah, but I want to go back to the Torah, the five books of Moses, because it was right there that God kind of began to make that clear to the Jewish people through Moses. And even before that, but I like the scripture here in Deuteronomy chapter four, and it's verses five and forward, Deuteronomy four. And, uh, Moses is speaking to Israel and he's explaining the people of Israel. He's explaining to them some things. He says, see, I have taught you decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me so that you may follow them in the land you are entering to take possession of it. Observe them carefully for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations. See, God all, already wants the people of the nations, the Gentiles, to understand that he is giving wisdom and understanding, and his hope is that the Gentiles will forsake idol worship, worshiping demons and worship things created by their own hands, and worship the living God who loves them. They don't have to, uh, like, uh, sacrifice their children to get the pleasure of the God. He loves them uh, the way they are, and he wants to help them to change, to be faithful children following his wisdom, his understanding, his teachings and commands. And then he goes on to say, uh, surely the uh, nations will say this about the Jewish nation, the people of Israel. Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Why? Because we're following God and his commandments and his teachings. And then they'll say, what other nation is so great to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray? And so our God is a God in our midst. He dwells in our midst. And uh, through Messiah Yeshua, he dwells right here in us and with us. And uh, he's not far away and he hears our prayers and he cares. And uh, then verse 8 and what other nation is so great to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I am setting before you today? And, you know, one of the reasons I think the United States of America became such a prosperous and great nation, and in some ways, even though we have many failures, a uh, blessing to so many nations of the world is because we were founded on biblical judeo Christian principles, principles from the scriptures, just what it says right here. It's amazing, isn't it? Amen. So let me say something else. That is that um, uh, some people are confused about, uh, about the land of Israel. You know, uh, why, why should the Jews have the land of Israel? I mean, there, this is, a, this is a, a huge topic. You and I could probably talk about it for hours. Don't forget, but, after Purim, we're going to dig into that maybe two episodes, so we don't want to go too much into it right now. 
Okay, I'll give them a little taste. So there were the the Jews because of disobedience and other other things, the rebellion. Uh, they uh, they were uh, conquered by first the Assyrians and then the Babylonians, taken away to Babylon. Um, and then after 70 years, they came back. That's called the first return. But there was a second return from the four corners of the earth. And, and so the one from in Jeremiah 32, it says the Lord, uh, it's given, the Lord says, uh, uh, the Lord God of Israel concerning this city, which you say it is given the hand of the king of Babylon by sword, by famine and by pestilence. Behold, I will gather them out of all the lands which I have driven them and I'll bring them back to their own land. So that's the first return from Babylon. The second return, uh, a couple places, one Isaiah says, uh, I will bring them, uh, bring your offspring from the east and gather them from the west. I will say to the north, give them up and the south, do not hold them back. So Babylon was due east of Israel. So this can't be Babylon because it's north, south, east and west. This is the great dispersion that happened in 70 AD. This is what we call the second return. And, uh, and then even in Isaiah 11, it says, then it will happen on that day that the Lord will again recover the second time with his hand, the remnant of his people and bring them back. So uh, why, why did God choose the Jewish people? Because he loved them and kept his covenant and his oath to the forefathers. And why did God choose his piece of real estate? Because he, he needed a homeland for these people that he had made covenant with. This is the land I'm going to give to you. And it's from this place that God is saying, I'm going to do all these mighty works and all these miracles. And I'm going to take you there. That's where you're going to settle. That's where Abraham put his 10 pegs down originally in Hebron or Hebron and or Hebron, depending on how, how you want to pronounce it. It's Hebron in Hebrew. And that's where the, the Jewish nation grew. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I want to remind you that uh, uh, next week we're going to be talking about the Feast of Purim, the story of Esther, Mordecai, and the uh, very uh, strong anti-Semitic Haman. Uh, and then after that, we are going to dig into the whole idea of Israel, the land, and we're going to give you uh, both a scriptural support for why the land was given by God to the people of Israel, the Jewish people. And we're going to give you some light on the modern uh, uh, state of Israel and the situation between the Israelis and the Palestinians and help uh, kind of unpack this whole thing and get to the facts and the truth. So we're going to next week, 5 p.m. right here. Uh, on the Reach Initiative International Facebook page live. We're going to be back 2 p.m. in uh, Pacific time to talk about Purim next Wednesday. And then after that, every Wednesday, 5 p.m., 2 p.m. Uh, Pacific, uh, we're going to be back to talk about the land of Israel, probably two episodes on that, so you're not going to want to miss that. Uh, and while you were speaking, Highland, I just... Uh, brought to mind two scriptures. First, I wanted to just quote that scripture from Isaiah, where the prophet made it really cl clear. And Isaiah was a Jewish prophet, and he made it really clear in Isaiah 49, 6, the uh, calling of uh, um, Israel, which ultimately, by the way, the calling of the Jewish people was ultimately fulfilled through Yeshua, and then through his followers to this day. And this is what it says in Isaiah 49, 6. It is, is it too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob? This is speaking of Messiah. And bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And if you take a look at Acts 13, 47, you'll note that Rabbi Shaul, better known as the Apostle Paul, he applied that scripture to himself as a follower of Yeshua, uh, that we are called to bring the light of God, the light of his Messiah, the light of his love and truth to the nations of the world. So I remember once, Highland, uh, I was... Uh, 
doing a seminar. I may have alluded to this once in, in India for about 350 uh, seminary students and Christian leaders. And at one point, a man who had a very strong uh, uh, influence over a small group, and he was a very strong believer in replacement theology, which states God is finished with the Jewish people and the people of Israel, and the church has replaced Israel uh, and the Jewish people. He got up and he said, don't give us, this was toward the end of the seminar, don't give us this stuff. You just want to tell us that the Jewish people are better than all of the rest of us. And uh, uh, fortunately, the whole thing was uh, recorded. And I said, well, if you listen carefully to what I said, and you can go back to the recording, you'll discover that I said the Jews are no better, or no worse than anyone else. It was God's choosing to choose us for a special purpose and role. And honestly, it's not always easy because we're called to bow the knee and to humbly serve the people of the nations. Now, even though we haven't always as a people successfully done that, that is our calling. And then I got on my knee and I said, this is why I came to you today. And this is why I came to India to serve you with the love of God and the truth that he has put into me through his scriptures as a Jewish man. And the whole place went wild. Everybody was clapping and cheering and saying, we don't believe this guy. We believe what you're saying. We heard you. And, you know, it was quite a moment. And uh, so we do face these challenges, you know. And so I think it's important that we also look carefully into the New Covenant scriptures, the New Testament, the Bird Hadashah, because some people say, well, that was in the old covenant. But what about now? Is God still faithful to his covenant with the Jewish people? Are the Jewish people still chosen? And what is the purpose? Why? So let's dig into that uh, a little bit. Okay. So uh, one tag off of what you just said about being the light to the nations and blessing the nations of the world I mean, even modern modern day Israel and the Jewish community worldwide, we have a concept that we call tikkun olam, which means the repair of the world. That's why the first mash unit typically in any uh, international disaster is an Israeli unit that arrives with their tents and their equipment and their, their medical supplies and doctors and nurses and they're there. And, and, and Jews are helping nations all over the world with the, they they're sharing their technology whether it's uh israelis who invented drip irrigation or their, their their solar accomplishments they're going into places all over the world in third world countries and helping people that's that's one thing so uh, the scripture that came to mind when you just asked that question to me uh, the first scripture i thought of was in romans 11 uh speaking of the uh the new covenant the New Testament, Paul says, I say, then God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be, or God forbid. So um, God hasn't rejected Israel. As a whole, you know, the Jewish nation, the Jewish people as a whole in the world have rejected the Messiah. In other words, you and I are Messianic Jews. We believe that Yeshua, Jesus is the Messiah of, of the world. And of everyone, but we're a small percentage of, of the Jewish world. Um, so you could say that a majority of Jews don't believe in Yeshua. Okay. However, because a lot of Gentiles think that because of that, God's rejected them. And Paul just clearly says in Romans 11 verse 1, that is not true. God has not rejected his people because God can't break a covenant. If God breaks the promises to Israel, there's no promises that God has made that you can even believe. So that's, you, you can bet your life on that one. Let's start there. It's very clear. And sometimes people ask me, Highland, they say, so why have the Jewish people suffered so much? Well, the Jewish people have suffered a lot, but so have people of the nations. And I want to give you a scripture that helps you to understand this. 
This, when I read this more than 40 years ago, it helped clarify a lot for me. And there are many other scriptures that support this understanding, but this comes from Romans chapter two, and I'm going to read verses nine through 11. And it says this, there will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, and then for the Gentile. And then verse 10 says this, but glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, and then for the Gentile, for God does not show favoritism. Mm, so I think good. what we can say is that the Jewish people are an example. They are on display for the whole world that when we individually as well as corporately obey God, we are blessed individually and corporately we are blessed if we obey God as a group of people. Amen. And if we don't, then we have all kinds of trouble and distress. And so it is with every other people group under heaven, because the God of Israel is the God of heaven and earth. He's the creator and he loves all, but he's also the just judge of all. So this really helps clarify things, I think. And, uh, you know, we're kind of running out of time. Um, but I want to invite all of our listeners to take advantage of an opportunity. We, I put together a, uh, an ebook that I want to give to you free of charge. It's called How to Pray for the Jewish People. There's a lot of scripture in there. It's an easy read, and uh, it's, it's free of charge. You can get it just by going to the Reach Initiative International Facebook page, where you're seeing this video maybe, uh, um, and just request the ebook, How to Pray for the Jewish People, or you can go to the Reach Initiative International website, and uh, you can just contact us there and say you would like the free ebook, How to Pray for the Jewish People. We would like to get that into your hands. We believe it'll be a a very helpful resource, and you can feel free to share it with others. Um, and I also want to extend to you one more opportunity. Uh, uh, we have been serving Holocaust survivors for the past 25 years, and uh, we serve Holocaust survivors both in the land of Israel and Belarus. And we really serve them week after week, month after month. Uh, but this Purim, probably going to be another lockdown in Israel, and Purim's usually a time to celebrate and rejoice. Mm -hmm. We have made the decision, we are going to bless 500 Holocaust survivors with a special Purim gift, fresh produce, and the love that our team brings, love and joy. And so if you would like to join with us in this, I invite you to pray for this, but also for $18, uh, 18 in Hebrew means chai or life, for $18, you can help us purchase this special gift and fresh produce for a Holocaust survivor and uh, bring them joy during this Purim season when survivors have been in a lot of lockdowns and uh, maybe in another one. So thank you for considering that opportunity. And for someone who's a little bit objective here, I want to say that um, I'm, I'm blessed to know Stuart and Chantal Winograd for Reach Initiative International, the great work that they're doing with Holocaust survivors in Belarus and in Israel. So I want to encourage you, um, not just because Stuart said it, but I'm adding my, uh, my kudos to the, the hard work that they do and the good work that they do in, in those countries. And the, the effects are worldwide. I think we need to close with the scripture from Romans 11, because it's already yes. about half an hour we've been going here. And this is, uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, basically our, our people have, have rejected the Messiah. And Paul says, now if, if their transgression be riches for the world and their failure be riches for the Gentiles, 
how much more will their fulfillment be? So Paul's saying that Jews and Gentiles are ha have some riches. They're coming into the kingdom. Then he says, for if their rejection be the reconciliation of the world, in other words, the Gentiles coming into the kingdom of God, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? So when Jewish people accept their Messiah, and you and I are testimony to this, it's like life from the dead. When I first heard that Yeshua was Messiah, Jesus was the Messiah, 5,000 years of Jewish history culminating in this, in God becoming flesh, it blew me away. And life from the dead means resurrection life. That means revival. That means the whole world's going to experience revival. As Jewish people come to know their Messiah, the world's going to be a much better place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, thank you for that. And uh, also, I want to remind everybody that uh, the sun is still shining and the moon is still in the sky. And Jeremiah chapter 31, 35, 37 says that God will never reject the people of Israel as long as the sun is in the sky, the moon is up there, and the waves of the sea are going back and forth. So, uh, it Amen. was stated clearly in the Old Testament, the Tanakh stated clearly in the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah, that God not only chose the Jewish people, he's faithful to his covenant, and uh, um, he has not rejected the Jewish people because the sun is still shining, the moon's still up there. That's and right. God has a special role for the Jewish people. We're no better, no worse than anyone else. We're all kind of sinners as the Bible says, who need to be saved by the grace of God manifest through Messiah Yeshua. But let's honor God's choice and his plan uh, and his choosing. And so I hope uh, this broadcast, this episode gives you some good scriptural foundations to uh, have a firm belief as to the fact that God chose the Jewish people, why he chose the Jewish people, and that he has not rejected the Jewish people. And so Amen. thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Hyland, would you close us with a word of prayer today? Sure. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your plans that are not of calamity, but with a future and a hope. God, thank you that you, you called Avram and you, uh, you used him to uh, bless all the families of the earth. God, we are grateful recipients of your wonderful gift of, of life, uh, abundant life here and everlasting life in the age to come. We thank you for Yeshua. Thank you for Messiah. Thank you that he's alive and well and rules and reigns in our hearts and in our families and in our congregations. We pray, Lord, he would rule and reign in the hearts and lives of Jewish people worldwide. That as uh, Jewish people uh, are calling out for the Messiah to come. Lord, reveal yourself to them through dreams, through visions, through revelation, through your word, through other people uh, coming across their path. And we thank you for this, uh, this short time together that we're having every, every Wednesday afternoon. May it be for your glory and your purposes. In the mighty name of Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah, amen. Amen. So it's been a delight to be here with you, Hyland, and all those that are with us. Thank you for your time. And uh, the video uh, recording will be on the Reach Initiative International Facebook page and the Beit Tikva Messianic Congregation Seattle page. Feel free to share them, share these uh, episodes with others, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next Wednesday. We're going to talk about Purim and uh, everything related to that feast next Wednesday, 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Central Time. Have a blessed week. We thank God for each one of you. Shalom. Shalom. God bless.